Hello everyone, glad to be back. Today is 12th of December, now it's half past 10 in the morning Moscow time. I'm Levan Gudadze and this is my first update for the day in which I will share all the main news that are making headlines in Russian media outlets and Russian language pages on different internet platforms um, at this point. Um, second update will be a little bit late in the afternoon in which most likely I will share with you a newest uh, latest report of Russian Defense Ministry on progress of special military operation during the previous 24 hours. Although, if any very significant development uh, during the day, of course, I will try to devote a separate video, separate short video to that topic uh, also. Let's see how they will go. And uh, well, before I begin with the news update, let me share with you also uh, additional information about our project. As I mentioned yesterday, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, I began creating um, uh, exclusive content for uh, Rumble, for my Rumble channel, for Rumble community. And the uh, first episode of uh, new program Telegram reports are already available on my Rumble page. Um, it's a uh, first episode. Uh, but uh, and may be a little chaotic but uh, with time of course i will try to polish this program uh, and to create it more and more interesting uh, well if you are watching this video on uh, on youtube uh, please dear friends consider to subscribe on my rumble channel you can see link under this video in the description box or in the pinned comment and when it comes to program itself in telegram reports i will share uh, with the uh, rumble community my reports on telegram during the day and uh, as many of you know know i do share on telegram um, dozens of uh, of uh, updates on daily basis and significant number of them cannot be in the main uh, video update uh, because uh, in that case update will take uh, like i don't know three four five hours and uh, therefore i will use this uh, separate program telegram reports to go uh, quickly through these uh, reports to through this news that I, I do share on my telegram on daily basis hopefully rumble community will find this program interesting and uh, and if so uh, well maybe telegram reports will help me to generate additional interest towards my rumble channel uh, that will be a uh, great uh, support of the project itself of course that's been uh, said and i remind you dear friends that my channels my channel on rumble are monetized on youtube my channel are not monetized but on rumble uh, channel is monetized and uh, if uh, sometime in the future we will have a uh, uh, thousands and thousands of members in our community and uh, and my videos will have thousands of views maybe rumble will become a quite significant source of income for a project so if you will watch my videos on rumble and and uh, and subscribe to my rumble that will definitely be a significant help to me and and uh, and my work that's been said, uh, that's been said, let's uh, talk about news now, sorry for a long uh, intro, time to time I do have some additional news about project that I want to share with you and I use beginning of the videos to, to do so. But anyway, let's talk about news now and, uh, and uh, well, according to latest reports from Russian and uh, Ukrainian uh, telegram channels during the night time Russian armed forces conducted another another wave of drone and missile strikes on logistical and military infrastructure of Kyiv regime and uh, explosions were heard in Odessa region in Nikolaev region Dnipropetrovsk region also Khmelnytsky region and in Krivoy a rogue area during the day russian defense ministry probably will share with us additional information and of course i will report about it on my telegram and in the next um, updates when it comes to line of uh, contact no significant changes according to reports from russian media and the military channels on any of the sectors of the front line but let's go sector by sector Kherson region uh significantly calm in comparison to previous weeks i guess Kyiv regime did finally realize that uh, left bank of Dnipro river truly is a trap for uh, 
Ukrainian forces and they are downgrading now intensity of uh, or activity of Ukrainian units in this area and some telegram uh, channels uh, in the Russian segment even began uh, expressing opinion that uh, that uh, Kyiv regime may withdraw its forces from um, at least some uh, some of the areas in the left bank especially in Krinky from Krinky uh, settlement which is uh, here by the way Ukrainian forces are uh, only what they managed during this uh, so-called Kherson counteroffensive is to establish small foothold in the central part of Krinky village sacrificing almost two brigades for this sacrificing almost two brigades for this if we combine casualties on in manpower and the losses in military equipment that key regime suffered in last two months in Kherson direction and I remind you dear friends that usually Ukrainian brigades are about two three thousand military personnel no more than that it's uh, it's in Russia and in the West that brigades are five six thousand as they sh should be but uh, in in Ukrainian uh, way brigade is just about two thousand military personnel not always even two thousand uh, so that's been said uh, overall situation overall situation in uh, Kherson direction of course always was under full Russian control always and uh, it's quite possible it's quite possible that uh, this uh, decrease in activity of Ukrainian uh, units may be connected with the uh, plans of the regime to basically withdraw its forces to the right bank let's see how the situation develop but uh, what is obvious and always was obvious and i was saying about it from very very first day of this uh, so-called ukrainian counteroffensive in Kherson direction left bank of Dnipro river was a trap for ukrainian forces and uh, they never had uh, even slight chance to achieve uh, anything whatsoever during this um, counteroffensive and uh, exactly that happened i mean i don't think uh, anybody can argue with that that they failed totally uh, well, let's continue with some other sectors of the front line now. Next, Zaporozhye and South Donetsk sectors of the front. Uh, usually, Zaporozhye sector is uh, most uh, quiet one for last several weeks in comparison to other sectors. And the uh, main hotspot here is, of course, uh, Arekhov bridgehead. Um, these areas between uh, Rabotina, Verbova, and uh, Novoprokopovka settlements mainly. Uh, mainly and the uh, situation for ukrainian forces are so desperate at this point that they are barely holding to their uh, positions in in rabotina village and uh, therefore i wouldn't be surprised if in upcoming days uh, rabotina will become uh, will become under russian control ukrainian forces may entirely withdraw their units from uh, from rabotina settlement uh, any movement of ukrainian units in this uh, area are controlled by russian forces and are targeted with the drones and uh, and artillery and basically all they do is is digging deeper and deeper in the, into the ground to somehow find a safe place from russian artillery and uh, and drones they are absolutely unable to conduct any more or less successful offensive operations they are unable to con conduct any operations at all uh, they are uh, break broken basically ukrainian grouping of forces in area of bridget are bridget are broke and um, i wonder when russian side will finally encircle this uh, area uh, encircle this ukrainian grouping of forces and and uh, and uh, give them a chance to basically lay down arms surrender and end and, uh, and the misery that they are experiencing for quite a while now when it comes to South Donetsk sector of the front line, it's uh, significantly active than uh, Zaporozhye sector of the front line because Russian forces are conducting local scale offensive operations and some Russian channels, some Russian channels are beginning uh, to express opinion that Novo Mikhailovka in fairly short time may become next hotspot and battles may erupt uh, inside this uh, settlement itself. Uh, According to some channels, forward units of Russian army already are in the in the village, and also, of course, uh, uh, Uglidar direction and uh, Vremovsky salient areas are quite active, where Russian forces on daily basis are trying to improve their positions. Although nothing is happening now in the ground scale, 
that can influence overall situation in this sector in immediate future. It's just the preparations of the ground by Russian side to conduct decisive actions when uh, when time is uh, right. Ukrainian forces are on defensive and are unable to basically uh, conduct any more or less significant scale uh, offensive uh, operations. Next, Donetsk direction, mo usually most active sector of the front line, and there is two hotspots, major hotspots in this area, Avdevka and uh, and uh, Bakhmut, of course. In Avdevka, we have uh, uh, from Avdevka we have some uh, interesting updates. Interesting updates. Yesterday afternoon, some Russian channels did began reporting that forward units of uh, Russian armed forces began operations in. Uh, chemical plant area in the northern industrial zone of uh, Avdeevka. I did not see, I did not see any photo or video confirmation uh, about this, but uh, because quite a big channels did report about it, I guess um, some at least reckoning force operations of Russian side have begun inside the Avdeevka chemical plant territory already and also in addition uh, reports are coming in that uh, some russian units even enter uh, even enter um, residential area areas of uh, avdevka from the northern from the northern side let's see let's see how will they develop and if we will receive some video or, or photo confirmation of that city itself is of course in operational encirclement uh, and uh, this opening that allows, uh, formally at least, uh, theoretically allows the regime to send uh, some uh, reinforcement or uh, or supply to ba Avdevka garnison is under constant Russian control and fire. And therefore, uh, we are seeing more and more videos, once again, new wave of videos from Avdevka area when Ukrainian units are complaining uh, and are basically demanding to be withdrawn. I don't think EU regime will listen to them uh, because they just don't care. Uh, but uh, Ukrainian soldiers in, and officers in Avdevka area definitely have a choice. They can contact Russian side and arrange uh, surrender. They can surrender to Russian forces, and I believe uh, in next several weeks' time, in next several weeks' time, we will see huge number of Ukrainian military personnel, personnel surrendering in Avdevka area. I expect at least several thousand Ukrainian soldiers to surrender in Avdeevka. That's my reading of uh, big picture. Let's see. Let's see how will situation develop. And when it comes to Bakhmut area, uh, when it comes to Bakhmut area, also Russian units are conducting local scale offensive operations in the southern flank of Bakhmut, in uh, Kurdjumovka, Andreevka, Klishevka areas and uh, reports are coming in that ukrainian units in this area are preparing to withdraw towards uh, water channel that goes uh, from from uh, kurdjumovka uh, and uh, then northwoods and cross uh, cross uh, areas in between bakhmut and uh, chisoviar also we are receiving reports that forward units of russian army entered ivanovska krasne russian name for the settlement is krasne uh, I did not see any photo or video, co video confirmations, but because of significant increase in activity from Russian forces in this area, I would not be surprised, definitely, if uh, Russian forces already are establishing some positions inside the Ivanovska and also uh, Bogdanovka uh, area is a hotspot on the northern flank of Bakhmut, and according to some reports, Russian forces are conducting operations inside the village now inside the village now and are almost reached uh, central parts of Bogdanovka. I guess uh, I guess it's only a matter of, uh, I don't know, days and uh, Ukrainian forces will flee Bogdanovka entirely. Uh, they are in quite in quite difficult, uh, difficult situation. And also also there were some reports that Russian forces began activities in Orecho Vasilyevka direction also which is a uh, northern flank of Bakhmut. So as, as you can see, initiative totally is in Russian hands. And uh, at this point, it do all depends on plans of Russian general staff. What plans do they have? Uh, will they authorize large-scale offensive operations in direction of Konstantinovka, uh, uh, Chisoviar, or they will hold on for a, for a time being? to conduct large-scale offensive operations simultaneously on multiple 
directions uh, during the winter operations that's uh, that's also possibility but yet again uh defense uh, ministry or, or general staff of course not sharing with me information so we can only have a, a guess based on information from open sources but anyway let's continue when it comes to northern sectors of the front line so Donetsk direction initiative is in Russian hands of course and the uh, main hotspot in this area is uh, is uh, Serbiansky forestry uh, and Russian forces are basically trying to uh, trying to uh, force out from this forestry Ukrainian units on daily on daily basis and if they achieve uh, uh, success in these operations then we, we can say that Seversk city itself will become uh, op in operational encirclement uh, which will definitely happen matter of time and when it comes to northern uh, Kupiansk direction, let's see, most northern sector at this point on the front line. Main hotspot is, of course, uh, of course, uh, Sinkovka village, which is uh, here. And uh, Sinkovka village and also this uh, forestry uh, next to Sinkovka, which is also disputed between the sides. But yet again, no decisive factions at this, at this point. And uh, as I said many times before, Russian forces are... Uh, in in uh, such positions in the northern sectors of the front line now that they are quite able to conduct large-scale offensive operations it all depends when they will receive green lights because uh, just take a look what is going on what is happening sinkovka and forestry right next to it is a major hotspot uh, if we are talking about kupiansk direction and uh, let's say today russian forces establish control on on this forest and area and and sinkovka and uh, what next next is kupiansk and to, Kupian, to conduct large-scale offensive in the direction of Kupiansk, uh, you have to need uh, secure your flanks, um, uh, and you have to conduct large-scale operation. Kupiansk is a city; it's not some kind of small village. It's a uh, quite a quite a large city, and without large-scale operation, uh, it's impossible to uh, move forward in the direction. And same goes for Seversk and this uh, Serbiansky forestry or Bogdanovka, not Bogdanovka, but uh, Belagorovka, sorry. Those, those villages do have time to time quite, you know, similar, uh, similar names, and it's easy to get mistaken. But anyway, uh, in the Severs direction, Belagorovka and uh, this forestry is, is a main hotspot at this point, isn't it? Although Russian forces are beginning, beginning their operations from southern side also and uh, uh, conducting operations in Visiola uh, uh, area and also in uh, Razdolovka area but uh, if we take uh, if we just conduct a thought experiment and let's say these settlements already are in Russian control and what next next is Seversk and to conduct operation towards Seversk you need large-scale operation once again so that's why I'm saying that in the in the northern sectors of the front line, Russian side at least for uh, last three four months are locked and ready to conduct large scale offensive operations. They have enough reserves in this area, enough force to do so. But uh, Russian forces are of course waiting. General staff is waiting for proper time, and proper time will be when uh, we will see uh, we will see. Uh, that that uh, you know cracks in defense lines of Ukrainian forces all along the front, and when we will see that uh, uh, Ukrainian armed forces basically are collapsing, that's that's the time that Russian defense ministry is waiting for, uh, because of course Moscow wants to minimize casualties and minimize damage on the ground, and if Ukrainian forces are unable to conduct uh, effective. Uh, operations uh, of course casualty numbers will be less on the both sides and uh, and the uh, destruction on the ground will be uh, as minimal as possible because after all we are talking about military operations and uh, my understanding is that ukrainian armed forces uh, will collapse in months or two close to end of january uh, uh, first half of february but yet again, I'm no military expert and I can be mistaken. But I expect Russian decisive factions exactly in, in, in January, February time uh, period. Let's see how 
things go. And this is it when it comes to short summary of the situation on the on the front line. Uh, and before I before I continue, let me uh, express my gratitude to to all of you towards all of you uh, and thank you all for your time and attention. Uh, and also, of course, special thank to members of our community that are supporting my work with donations through PayPal, buy me a coffee or by subscribing to my Patreon page. Without your attention and support, this project uh, would uh, definitely not exist and I would not have opportunity, this unique and great opportunity to work uh, on this uh, project and be, be a citizen journalist. So thank you very much for your uh, attention and support. Let's talk about additional news now and uh, RIA Novosti is reporting that this morning, this morning, Russian air defense system shut down Ukrainian Tochka U ballistic missile over the Belgorod region. Uh, five o'clock this morning, uh, Tochka U was launched by Kyiv regime and uh, uh, Russian air defense systems were ready to deal with the, with the threat and uh, this ballistic missile was shut down. No reports about casualties on the ground or um, on the ground where fragments of this missile fail or any uh, significant damage uh, to, to infrastructure. But yet again, you can clearly see that the uh, Kyiv regime is trying desperately to hit deep inside Russian territory and cause as much uh, casualties among civilians and as much damage as they possibly can. Because we all know what kind of uh, individuals Zelensky and his associates are. Also, Rienovost is reporting that in Donetsk uh, sector of the front line, Russian armed forces repelled 18 local scale, uh, 18 local scale uh, counteroffensives of Ukrainian armed forces, which is a quite a number. And once again, once again, I remind you, uh, uh, dear friends, that uh, Kyiv regime constantly tries and to regain initiative on any of the directions on the front line, and they are sacrificing hundreds and hundreds of military personnel on daily basis. In these uh, uh, suicidal counteroffensives, and uh, well, Donetsk sector is no exception, and, and as you can see, according to Russian Defense Ministry, 18 times Ukrainian forces did launch this. Uh, suicidal counteroffensives and as a result of the clashes in this area they lost about uh, 200 military personnel just in one sector of the front line without achieving anything whatsoever initiative is in totally in russian hands in donetsk and every other sector of the front line that it's the russian forces that are gaining control over the more and more territories and improving their positions uh, also ria is uh, reporting that uh, movement of uh, 63rd mechanized brigade of uh, Ukrainian armed forces were uh, noticed in Serebryansky forestry, which is Krasny Liman direction. I did just spoke about uh, Seversk area and Serebryansky forestry area. And well, as a result of uh, Russian strikes on these uh, units of uh, Ukraine's 63rd mechanized brigades that were conducting movement in Serebryansky forestry, they lost about 50 military personnel, which is also quite a high level of uh, casualties. Uh, they did not probably even realize uh, from where fire was uh, coming towards them in that forest. Also, TAS News Agency is reporting that um, also TAS News Agency is reporting that uh, Zelensky, who is in US uh, already, did ask, of course, for uh, for more weapons and more money, money, and even even somewhat criticized U.S. Congress. U.S. Congress. Uh, he was uh, giving a speech in uh, Was in in Washington in uh, National University of Defense, and during his speech, he did uh, said that uh, they need desperately uh, U.S. Bradleys infantry fighting vehicles, high mars uh, multi-launch rocket systems, shells, 155 millimeter shells, and also missiles, Atakams missiles, F-16s, and, and plenty of other weapons. If you, if you give them a chance, they will, of course, ask for nuclear weapons also. 
uh, and he was somewhat critical of the US Congress and he said that if Congress will not authorize these additional funds to give regime then US will lose its uh, role as a leader of this world I don't know who told Zelensky that US is a leader for anybody uh, in this world I don't think so uh, I never see US as a leader of uh, some sort uh, uh, never uh, and uh, maybe Zelensky did maybe he's in this uh, you know disturbed reality where uh, US is a dominant power in this world again and everybody is listening to Washington but in reality everybody everybody with the exception of these puppets like Zelensky and so on uh, just don't give a damn about uh, what Washington has to say that's uh, that's reality in this world vast majority of the humanity opposes Washington and the Western ruling class and when I say Washington I mean Western ruling class I have no issues with US as a state itself and uh, in my understanding if some somehow sometime in the future US will have a decent government and decent, decent elites it will be immensely helpful for humanity but uh, well I don't think that's a possibility even US citizens are now too skeptical that they will ever manage to regain control over their state. Even US citizens are skeptical of it. And of course, me to be skeptical, uh, not gonna be surprised. I mean, our friends from US can tell us, do they really think that they have a chance to regain control over their republic? <clears throat> I mean, really. System in US is so corrupt and so... Uh, build around the uh, interests of one uh, percent let's say that uh, the rest of the citizens of us just are out you know out of action let's say uh, not on the board of decision making process so zelensky is i mean he's in this it's this crazy world where i don't know uh what kind of illusions he sees, but the uh, US lost uh, its leadership uh, even in the, in, the, in the Western world. And yes, today capitals in the West are obeying orders for, from Washington, but do they have respect for Washington? And uh, when it comes to leadership, true leadership is based on respect. And do Washington have respect among major capitals let's say even in the western world no no it's simple true like it or not but no one respects washington no more anyway anyway who cares about zelensky but uh, but u.s uh, congressman u.s congressman from ohio republican James uh, David Wentz was uh, very upset, very upset that uh, this clown was invited into Washington by Biden's administration. And he said some quite strong words during his interview on the Fox News, according to RIA Novosti, or TAS News Agency, sorry. And, uh, well, this uh, congressman did said that he is basically embarrassed. He is embarrassed that uh, Zelensky was invited in the Washington, uh, Washington and and he will speak to Congress now and the congressmen have to listen how Zelensky will uh, begin uh, teaching them what is right and what is wrong and how they should act and this is in in in, in words of this uh, congressman is most embarrassing point of his career as a congressman he never see anything and anything more embarrassing than this uh well some very strong feelings from uh, from the u.s republican isn't it here uh they are forced now they are you know <clears throat> i can understand that they are upset because they are <clears throat> under constant pressure from a military industrial complex from biden's white house uh, from lobbies and and so on to approve this uh, Biden's aid package in which 61 billion is supposed to go to give regime 
from which of course uh, of course vast amount will eventually end up on bank accounts of u.s military industrial complex and uh, and very same corrupt officials uh and eventually eventually i think a u.s congress will vote for this uh, biden they would not withstand pressure i mean u.s military industrial complex is just too powerful in u.s just too powerful and uh, maximum what these congressmen can do a decrease uh, um, number of uh, or somewhat decrease uh, um, level of money that they are willing to authorize for uh, allocate for ukraine from 61 billion to i don't know 40 billion maybe and uh, well even this uh, even um, i mean i'm not quite sure that they will manage even even this to happen that's how how uh, powerful uh, lobbies and military industrial complex really are in in us they can do anything really and they can force uh, congress and senate to approve any decision that they like any let's continue anyway and rt is reporting that uh, according to former aide of zelensky and his advisor alexei aristovich uh, now is the time to start thinking about negotiation uh negotiating peace with russia with the situation looking more helpless on the front line a former advisor to ukrainian president vladimir zelensky has said uh, and this advisor's name is uh is alexei alistovich uh somewhat uh, uh, popular individual in in ukraine and personality whose candidacy according to russian uh foreign intelligence service also was mentioned during the discussion in the eu among eu leaders when they were uh, basically discussing who may replace uh, uh, who may replace zelensky although of course zaluzhny is number one candidate at this at this point but anyway alexei aristovich told uh, i news that zelensky has become a hostage or to his own propaganda to do it to his uh, propensity to play the hero in uh, parliaments around the world the former president uh, presidential advisor and the spokesman who has uh, fallen out of favor with the kiev said zelensky currently thinks not about the national interest but about his own position well what a surprise what a surprise you know when uh, alistovich was working for zelensky i mean he did not notice this i mean all of us did knew straight away that Zelensky was just a clown puppet uh, of Western ruling class and all he was care about is, is his own interests and to please his Western masters. But well, Aristovich just now realized this, you know, since he uh, no longer in favor, uh, favorite of, of, uh, of Zelensky. But uh, anyway, uh, Aristovich uh, thinks that uh, for Russia uh, for Russia uh, it's uh, peace talks are uh, important so that Ukraine will not join NATO that's a precondition that will be taken in account by by Kyiv are supposed to be taken in account but for ukraine main point is to stop the stop this war itself and of course aristovich is mistaken here in in, in part of uh, russia's interest or russia's position he is very much mistaken because maybe he he thinks uh, that uh, ukraine never had any chance to join nato but uh, here in russia we knew from the uh, very beginning that ukraine will never become a member of nato uh based uh, even based on uh, uh nato's uh, um, treaty nato's uh Ustav. how you say Ustav, man i'm always forgetting this word you know charters even based on the charters of nato that this organization is built on and uh, one of the major charters is that country who has who is engaged in a war in a military conflict and has some territorial issues cannot become a member of nato that's it and therefore 
Ukraine never had a, since the 2014 even theoretical chance to become a member of uh, NATO. So Russia don't care about this topic <clears throat> no more because there is no question uh, Ukraine becoming a NATO member. Uh, so if they think uh, they can give Russia now guarantees or they can promise Russia that, you know, we will not join NATO and blah, blah, blah. I mean, Moscow would not listen because Moscow just, you know, Moscow knows already that they will not join NATO. And Moscow also knows that after this conflict will end, there will be no more Ukraine as a state. So, of course, it will not join no organization at all. Not NATO, not EU, not uh, anything else. Uh, vast majority of Ukraine will become under, under control of Russia initially and, uh, and then part of Russia. That's how it's going to end. That's how it's going to be. And Western regions of Ukraine were strongholds of Ukrainian neo-Nazis and their uh, ideology is those Western regions will become uh, uh, part of uh, Western neighbors of uh, Ukraine and Poland, Hungary, Romania and Slovakia will be forced and, and basically NATO will be forced to deal with those Ukrainian neo-Nazis then. Let's see how will they like it. Anyway, let's continue. Ria Novosti is reporting that uh, US is planning to send its general to Kiev so that he will uh, actively participating in planning of operations on behalf of uh, Kiev regime. This was reported by New York, New York Times and even a uh, even name has been uh, mentioned. This general lieutenant is Antonio Aguto, who has, be, has been chosen by Pentagon to be transferred to Kiev and some uh, military games will be conducted with uh, under leadership of this general in Ukraine and then in Germany also so that uh, so that Washington will try to help Kiev regime to come up with some new strategy in this conflict yet again uh, uh, yet again uh, some Irrelevant at this point, absolutely irrelevant moves from uh, from Washington. Uh, they already managed to uh, force Kiev to destroy basically uh, last reserves that they have by uh, begin by authorizing this uh, uh, so-called counteroffensive. And uh, let's see what other plan Washington will have for for uh, for Ukraine and how many thousand more citizens of Ukraine gonna die for another uh, suicidal or incompetent plan of Pentagon. Because at this point, dear friends, at this point I have to say that uh, I guess, uh, I mean, some of you may dis disagree with me, but my understanding is that after Washington Post Post's article, that uh, U.S. Pentagon was actively involved in uh, in uh, game planning on, on planning and of uh, Ukraine's counteroffensive, and uh, even some uh, military games were conducted um, in Germany to prepare this counteroffensive as much as possible. And U.S. Uh, generals were participating in it. Other NATO member states also, and uh, and they failed so miserably. They failed so miserably that at this point I'm quite sure that uh, Pentagon lost competency, really. Some 20, 30 years ago, uh, Pentagon did have uh, quite competent generals, I believe, at least uh, when they were planning this operation in, in Iraq. Uh, they did manage to uh, conduct operations in, in, a, in a combined operations in quite large scale and quite successfully but i guess since then uh, there was some generational change in in pentagon in leadership of u.s army and uh, these old experienced generals have been generals colonels have been probably removed from duty and some other people enter their positions and these other people they are men they are incompetent they really are incompetent because it's their plan what the regime uh, did during the uh, counteroffensive. 
it's 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 that's what Washington and what that's what Pentagon told Zelensky's regime to do. That was their game plan. That was their military uh, plan, and they failed so miserably that now uh, one may wonder uh, what kind of crazy ideas Pentagon will uh, will have and uh, and how many Ukrainian citizens will will die for this new obviously failed plan that Kyiv regime will receive from uh, destined to failure, new plan that is destined to failure, let's say this way, that Kyiv regime will receive from uh, Pentagon. I'm quite surprised, to be honest. I'm quite I, I, I did not expect that uh, leadership of military leadership of US is so incompetent in planning of operations, large-scale of operations, in comparison to Russian general staff, U.S. generals uh, look like, uh, I don't know, man, some uh, enthusiasts, you know, not professionals, but some somewhat like enthusiasts that are like to talk about military stuff, but have no idea about real uh, uh, things, you know. But anyway, anyway, let's continue, let's continue. Uh, Kiev should be scared, man. Of, uh, of ideas that they are receiving from Washington and, uh, and the military plans. Ria Novosti is reporting that, uh, well, that uh, a colonel, colonel of Ukrainian armed forces did, uh, did give an interview to Ukrainian channel NTA or HTA and uh, during the interview, this Ukrainian colonel, Roman Kostchenko, did openly said that uh, at this point, at this point, Ukrainian forces are not even close to Russian side when it comes to weaponry, when it comes to weaponry, and uh, especially when it comes to strategic weapons that are used in the, in the battlefield. Uh, in this case, I guess he was uh, talking about some long-range uh, weapons that uh, Russia is deploying on the battlefield. Well, he's, uh, he's absolutely correct, despite the fact that they are receiving even ballistic missiles from, uh, from Washington uh, and cruise missiles from European states. Uh, well, Ukrainian forces are really not nowhere near to Russian side when it comes to battle capabilities. And I remind you, dear friends, I remind you that Russian side is uh, not conducting large scale offensive operations and are no in hurry to push frontline westwards as soon as possible because Russian forces want to minimize casualty numbers and Russian forces, Moscow wants to minimize destruction on the ground because we all seen many, many times videos and photos from uh, settlements that are currently on the line of contact and those uh, the settlements are basically decimated. And it's Russia that's going to rebuild these settlements, isn't it? So it definitely makes all the sense for Russian side, from Russian point of view, to demilitarize Ukrainian army, to demilitarize the regime on the current line of contact, to make sure that uh, Ukrainian forces are no longer able to put up some, uh, some uh, uh, fierce battles. And only then it does make any sense to uh, conduct large-scale offensive operations for Russia so that there will be minimal number in casualties and there will be minimum destruction on the ground because uh i mean as i said man it's it's uh, it's russian taxpayers that gonna pay to rebuild everything that was destroyed during this uh, hostilities isn't it and uh, it's obvious that russian side wants to first demilitarize Ukrainian key regime and then began large-scale offensive operations and 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 uh, establish control over the more and more and liberate basically more and more territories from key regime let's continue art is reporting that UK is to provide uh, Ukraine with the uh, Navy ships uh, well I would not call this uh, uh, this small uh, vessel uh, like ship it sounds like it's uh, I don't know a destroyer some some sort of but in reality in reality UK will transfer to or at least plans to transfer to Kyiv regime two boats 
uh, mine sweeping boats and uh, well this these ships will not definitely go through through sea through black sea for sure uh, they can enter black sea and then stay in romania for a while if they want to or in bulgaria but they definitely cannot enter uh odessa waters of uh, territorial waters of ukraine russian side will not allow this and therefore i guess if london is serious about sending two two minesweeper boats to give um, they will do it through rivers i guess they will do it through rivers uh and uh, once they will arrive in uh in ukraine let's say in uh, ismail city on danube river or any other uh, city there the russian side will probably take next day will take out these ships these boats uh it's a it's a small small vessels small vessels uh let me read it uh britain will provide ukraine with the two mine clearing ships as a part of new maritime coalition the country's ministry of defense has announced the new uh initiative will also include norway as is uh, said to be a long term aiming to make kiev's navy more inter interoperable with nato I mean, this they, they won't get rid of some uh, some uh, s scrap metal, I guess, and that's all it is, really. Because uh, I mean, what they are talking about? What you, uh, you Ukraine's integration with NATO, man? Uh, and where is the name of these ships, man? That's it. London will initially transfer two Sandown class mine contain counter measure vessels uh, so it's a sando class sando class we can google it right now uh, just to see what we are talking about that's it man these boats man will be sent to Q regime if they will you know manage to uh, you know, uh, go this distance. They may sunk somewhere, man. Who knows in which years these these boats were built? In sixties, fifties? <laughs> I don't know. London just want to get rid of some crap, man. But anyway, let's uh, let's continue. Let's continue. Rianovost is reporting that. Uh, well, yesterday I devote to this topic uh, separate video that uh, yes eu is uh, is discussing uh, candidacies of uh, of uh, figures in ukraine who may replace zelensky several names are have been mentioned according to russian foreign intelligence during discussions among leaders of uh, eu and eu member states among them among them uh, budanov zaluzhny also arestovich uh, also current head of uh, current head of uh, presidential office Andrei Yermak and the mayor of Kyiv Vitaly Klitschko and um, well if you want to learn some more about this news uh, yesterday I did uh, I did share separate video on this topic uh, short video it's just 18 minutes uh, and I discuss this article in more detail but I will just say now that um, well, from these uh, names that uh, have been mentioned during the discussions in the among EU leaders, only Zaluzhny has real chances. Only Zaluzhny has uh, real chances because he has uh, support of military and he has some support of uh, public in, in Ukraine. And uh, therefore, uh, I guess Zelensky and his associates will definitely try to neutralize Zaluzhny to take him out one way or another and I guess uh, UK's military intelligence will will be forced to uh, do its best to, to protect Zaluzhny because Zaluzhny is a uh, operative let's say of London he's asset of London not to Washington when uh, Budanov in other hand head of Ukraine's military intelligence and uh, 
and Zelensky himself, they are assets of CIA. They are assets of Washington. So some confrontation here between uh, indirect, let's say, confrontation between London and uh, Washington. Although I guess uh, in Washington, uh, real decision makers are probably realizing that uh, Budano also has no chances and Zelensky has to be replaced. So best candidacy is, uh, is in current situation in Ukraine. Best candidate they have is Zaluzhny. Uh, but, you know, who knows, man, these rogue uh, criminals, these rogue individuals like Zelensky, he's in a circle and also Budano and his, uh, his group of uh, terrorists and mass murderers and, and criminals, they may do anything. They may not just uh, uh, wage war between each other, Budano and Zelensky, but they also may strike on the uh, camp of Zaluzhny. So, in coming months, we may see some internal uh, armed confrontation in Ukraine between these three camps, Zelensky, Budanov, and uh, Zaluzhny. Uh, but let's uh, continue. How long is this update, man? 51 minutes. Okay, I will at least try to go through headlines. So, RT is reporting that EU's... Uh, Wonder Lion issues a reality check on Ukrainian membership. Well, quite uh, strange and interesting. The potential accession of uh, Ukraine into EU will not be on the agenda at the Bloc summit this week. The European Commissioner, uh, Commission President Ursula, Ursula von der Leyen has uh, said, <clears throat> Ursula washing machines, yes. Ursula washing machines uh, uh, and tatters tatters. <laughs> uh, Der Leinen uh, has said she noted that the 27 leaders would merely discuss whether to launch membership talks with the Kyiv, with the road to actual accession likely to be lengthy. Well, I guess uh, I guess uh, at least some people in EU leadership are basically kind of embarrassed that they have they have been forced to talk about this nonsense uh, topic how Ukraine gonna become a member of EU and therefore uh, there is no uh, there is no in incentive uh, there in, in Europe to discuss this topic because uh, they look like clowns really they may are clowns but they also look like one when they are discussing topics that are total nonsense and less and uh, less people are taking them seriously uh, as a result of it worldwide not just in uh, in eu itself but uh, worldwide um, anyway let's continue tas uh, news agency is reporting that eu uh, in this month will transfer to give regime 1.5 billion in a uh, budget su support uh, for budget support uh, and i remind you dear friends that uh, more than a million citizens of ukraine uh, including high-ranking officials uh, militaries and and uh, and people that are working basically in budget sector in the state-run enterprises they will they are receiving wages uh, from EU and uh, and uh, US taxpayers mainly. It's uh, taxpayers in uh, US and taxpayers in EU that pay wages for more than a million people in Ukraine. And that's uh, this money going uh, direction to this 1.5 billion from EU to pay wages to some uh, million people in, in Ukraine. Of course, 1.5 billion is not going to be enough, but uh, US will also send something and 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 well, eventually at some point, of course, Kyiv will not be able to pay wages uh, because uh, EU and uh, uh, North America will cut this constant money flow to Kyiv regime. But at least now, at least for now, billions and billions are still pouring into Kyiv regime, into hands of Kyiv regime. Then, anyway, let's continue. TASS News Agency is reporting that, uh, according to Financial Times article, 
the European Commission is uh, planning to collect about 15 billion euros until 2027 uh, from Russian uh, frozen assets, from profits on uh, on Russian frozen assets, and uh, send this uh, 15 billion to the regime. Yet again, the uh, European Central Bank did already made statement about it that if uh, EU bureaucrats will touch even a single penny of frozen Russian assets, it will uh, basically finally destroy the reputation of uh, European Union and the Euro. And it will, in long term, it will devastate the Eurozone and economy of uh, a Eurozone. But, uh, well, I don't think bureaucrats in Brussels do care about uh, these warnings from uh, Frankfurt. It's a Frankfurt, isn't it, that uh, European Central Bank is based. Anyway, anyway, let's see how all things develop. But these, these uh, bureaucrats are too keen to steal Russian assets uh, that are frozen in, in the West and uh, they will do it. Most likely they will, you know, they will do it. They just, they can't help themselves. They want to steal this money. And most likely they will. They will listen to nobody, man. Not the Central Bank of Europe, not to nobody. You know, they they want to steal this money and they will, uh, most likely. Anyway, RT is reporting that EU state to reduce welfare payments to Ukrainian refugees. That's uh, quite uh, also interesting news, especially for Ukrainian refugees that are planning to go to Ireland. Uh, maybe they are watching this video and uh, this information will be helpful to them. Uh, the Irish government is set to drastically reduce welfare payments to future Ukrainian refugees in a move designed to signal that the EU country has reached its limit of the number of asylum seekers it can accept from uh, Kyiv, from Ukraine. The Irish Times reported on uh, Monday, citing government uh, sources. The proposal from Dublin, uh, Dublin's Minister for uh, Integration, uh, Roderick O. Gorman, includes uh, reducing welfare payments of uh, Ukrainians from 20, 20, 220 euros per week now, which is 236 uh, US dollars approximately, uh, to just 38.50 euros, which is 41 dollars. The same weekly uh, sum currently being offered to asylum seekers of the other nationalities. So it seems like it's only Ukrainians that are receiving 220 euros a week as a support Ukrainian refugees. Other nationalities that also are refugees in Ireland, they are receiving just 38.50 uh, euros a week. And the new Ukrainian refugees that are, you know, planning to, that Ukrainian refugees that are planning to move to Ireland should know that they would not be able to receive these 220 euros a week. So how are they going to live on 38 euros? I don't know, man. It's even possible. How are they going to live on 38 euros? And how other refugees are managing to live on 38 euros? Uh... I don't know. I don't know, but uh, same time, Ukrainian refugees that already are in Ireland and are receiving this 220 euro a week, they will continue to receive this this money, at least for time being. But I guess sometime in the future, probably they will lose this support. Also, uh, I guess uh, I guess it's just too much. It's too much pressure on uh, Irish economy. Uh, there are so many refugees, and uh, uh, it's a uh, hundred thousand. Uh, Ireland already housing or, or, or received hundred thousand refugees from Ukraine, so it's not a small number. And these hundred thousand on weekly basis are receiving two hundred and twenty euros, and just make a calculation, and we are talking about millions and millions on. Uh, daily basis that have been spent to you know support ukrainian refugees so hardly kiev can have any you know 
or Ukrainian refugees can any ha can have any bad feeling towards Ireland. They truly did what they can, but probably they will they will you know offer some jobs for refugees so they can uh, work, earn some money, and pay for themselves. That's how it's gonna be, I guess. Let's continue. Let's continue. And uh, is that it when it comes to? Okay. Next hot topic is Middle East, of course. Middle East as news agency is reporting that Israeli army is storming uh, Jenin, city of Jenin, on in the west bank of uh, Jordan uh, River. Well, lately Israeli army are quite active in in West Bank also. Uh, also, yesterday I did share information that uh, Israeli side did conducted uh, operations in the southern Gaza Strip. So clashes are intensifying all around, all around in this uh, in this region, and uh, Israel is quite actively shelling Syria, bombing Lebanon. Uh, so situation is is extremely difficult and only intensity of clashes are only only increasing and uh, which is quite unfortunate and task news agency is reporting that according to uh, latest reports uh, since the beginning of uh, ground operation in the gaza strip israeli forces lost 105 military personnel that's a number that uh, idf is sharing with public uh, uh, one may assume that uh, real number is like somewhat high uh, overall overall since the escalation since the 7th of october israeli army lost more than 400 military personnel that's official number so i mean we can take with pinch of salt official data but uh, that's uh, that's at least uh, information that we are getting from official sources. Also, RT is reporting that uh, Israel used US-made white phosphorus munition in, uh, in, in Lebanon during its attacks. Um, well, I did share this information on my Telegram uh, yesterday. This is reported by Washington Post. And, uh, well, too bad, really, too bad, but... Uh, that's a reality on the ground. Israel will use everything they can or everything they have, uh, with the exception of nukes, at this point. And uh, if uh, if if things go very badly for Israel, I'm quite sure they will use nukes also. So I'm not at all surprised that they are using white phosphorus during the battles. Um, and I'm not surprising that uh, Washington did send munitions with white phosphorus to Israel. Washington is also uh, quite quick to use white phosphorus uh, on the battlefield. And everybody probably remember Fallujah, uh, one of the bloodiest battles in Iraq uh, for uh, for uh, Ukrainian, sorry, for, for U.S. armed forces. Uh, Ukrainian army has its own b battles in, in, in Ukraine uh, and are losing. But in Fallujah, in Fallujah, US uh, did use extensively white phosphorus and uh, no one knows real number how many civilians were killed as a result of it, but uh, it's, it's going to be a huge number. Anyway, let's uh, continue. Uh, white phosphorus is a uh, is a. Uh, of course, many of you know that it's uh, it's a uh, it's chemical substance that burns in extremely high temperatures and it's almost impossible to put out the fire from it. It's a uh, it's poisonous. It uh, uh, ejects while burning. It ejects poisonous gas that uh, burns people from within, and uh, this. Uh, while burning white phosphorus itself is almost impossible to extinguish a fire. It can burn through anything, uh, basically. Uh, Russia is not using... Russia was accused that uh, they are, you know, Russian forces are using white phosphorus on the battle, but this is lie. Russian side use, uh, uses different type of uh, incendiary ammunition. 
probably many of you did see these videos in the night time when, uh, it, when it, it looks like a fireworks really it's an incendiary ammunition that has nothing to do with white phosphorus russian side not using white phosphorus at all on the battlefield uh, but western media and western so-called elites were quick to blame russia because they are stupid man they don't have a knowledge of anything really and when they see these videos probably they assume that you know it was white phosphorus when it, it's not and they were very quick to uh, blame russia in this although military experts uh, straight away of course did said that i mean just shut the, you know you have no idea what you're talking about but very same media outlets and politicians are now quiet when israel in in reality are using white phosphorus that's double standards uh, that is uh, usual stuff for uh, western media and so-called western ruling class RT is reporting that uh, US wants Israel to finish Gaza war by year end, uh, by end of this year, reported by Economist, which is a false news yet again, just false propaganda by uh, Western media and uh, attempt to somehow uh, save face for uh, Biden's administration. Because in reality, in reality, we all know that it will take just one call from Washington to Netanyahu and this conflict is done. This conflict will end very same day. But instead of uh, making this call, Biden's administration is sending more and more weapons uh, to Netanyahu and his associates and basically uh, supporting everything that Netanyahu's government did already. So these type of articles that Washington wants this and Washington wants that and Washington cares about casualties among civilians, Palestine, this is uh, all uh, uh, fake news, fake propaganda of the Western ruling class through their propaganda outlets and attempt to some, somehow do some damage control and uh, save face of uh, current administration in Washington. In reality, just, they just don't care. They just don't care. They are in full support of Netanyahu's government and they are guilty. They are participants of mil war crimes that uh, Netanyahu's government committed in Palestine and crimes against humanity. Biden and his administration, they are participants in this crime against humanity that Netanyahu's government is committing in uh, Palestine. It's a uh, simple true. It's just factual. It's factual. Let's continue. Ria Novost is reporting that uh, in Red Sea, Norwegian tanker was hit by missile that presumably was launched by Ansar Allah uh, formations from Yemen, Houthi rebels. Uh, they are more known worldwide as the Houthi rebels. And uh, well, uh, it's uh, not yet known what uh, how severe damage was done uh, as a result of the strike to a tanker. If there is any spell of uh, fuel uh, in the Red Sea, uh, all we know at this point, the tanker was a chemical one. It was transporting some chemical uh, substances. And on a telegram, I did see several videos of explosions on the ship, but without confirmation that this is exactly the tanker that uh, was uh, hit uh, previous uh, uh, previous night, I guess, uh, by Houthi rebels, and uh, therefore um, uh, I didn't share that video on my Telegram, but uh, tanker itself was definitely hit, and uh, we may unfortunately see some uh, ecolo uh, ecological uh, uh, catastrophe in the, in the Red Sea if this tanker was full of some chemical uh, substances, and if, if it will sink. Of course, during the day, I will monitor the situation and if I see any additional news, I will report about it on, uh, on the Telegram in next updates. Also, also, the France Task News Agency reported and many other Russian channels that yesterday, President of Russian Federation was in, uh, in Severodvinsk, uh, northern, one of the most northern cities of uh, Russian Federation, and he was participating in a ceremony of... Uh, a rising Russian, rising flag of uh, Russian Navy, 
on two nuclear submarines, Krasnoyarsk and Emperor Alexander III. And uh, he did make a statement during this uh, ceremony and he said that, uh, of course, nuclear fleet is immensely important for Russia's uh, deterrence force, nuclear deterrence force. Uh, it, they play a huge role in Russian nuclear triad. And uh, at this point, at this point, five, uh, five, uh, Yasen, Yasen M class uh, nuclear submarines are in process of being built, and and uh, in upcoming uh, years, uh, at least two or three Bore A class uh, uh, nuclear uh, submarines strategic missile carriers uh, will be uh, transferred to Russian Navy, new ones. Uh, so Bore A class submarines, nuclear submarines are ones that are uh, carrying nuclear missiles, nuclear capable missiles, intercontinental ba ballistic missiles with the nuclear warheads. And the uh, Yasen M class submarines, they are hunter submarines basically. Uh, they can. Uh, they are carrying torpedoes. They are carrying uh, cruise missiles, and usually they are uh, always right next to, right next to uh, this uh, rocket strategic uh, missile carrier submarines to protect them, to protect them, and uh, if necessary, to hunt down any enemy ship that will uh, impose any danger to Russian. Uh, a missile carrier so well uh, despite uh, despite the western sanctions and uh, attempts to destroy russian economy well russian economy is not just holding but are quite able to heavily invest in, in um, heavily invest in in military and uh, well in upcoming years in upcoming years russia will receive uh, at least seven to eight new nuclear submarines attack submarines and also uh, strategic missile carriers which will of course reinforce russian uh, nuclear triad significantly and also ria Novosti is reporting that decision have been made by let me translate this because i don't know how in english you say it's sick so the Central Election Commission uh, of Russian Federation decided to hold presidential election in new regions. Also, uh, earlier, earlier uh, yesterday, uh, Russian Defense Ministry and SBU uh, did made statements that they think uh, it's fit to conduct presidential elections safely in new regions uh, of Russian Federation uh, and. Uh, after that, after that, uh, Central Election Commission did made a statement that elections will also be held in new in new regions um, in 2024 on so from 15th to 17th of of uh, uh, March, I believe, uh, when elections will take place, presidential elections. Let's continue, and elections will be held on for three days. So, citizens of Russia will have no hurry. They can vote at any point during that that three days, uh, which is quite interesting uh, stuff. I mean, I don't think I will participate in elections anyway, uh, even if they will give us like a week <laughs> to do so. But uh, but you know, if I if I was planning to participate, of course, it makes it much more uh, easier and uh, convenient when you have a free days and you can vote just any time you want. That's uh, good, good stuff, I believe. Uh, so let's continue. Let's continue. And uh, well, next news is about uh, border between Russia and Finland. As you know, uh, it's already second week, I believe, that Finland uh, blocked, uh, closed all the border crossings with Russia. And Council of Europe uh, now uh, criticizing Helsinki for this decision. Let me read several sentences here. So, 
Council of Europe uh, has voiced concern over Finland's decision to close all border crossings with Russia, <coughs> warning that move could leave extremely vulnerable migrants stranded without uh, shelter during the cold winter months. Uh, well, okay, I can I can see this Council of Europe is coming from. Uh, and uh, well, I don't think Helsinki will change its uh, its, uh, its its decision anytime soon. Uh, but uh, but let's see, they may, they may, and uh, refugees. Uh, I remind you, dear friends, that um, citizens of a number of uh, countries worldwide were trying to use Russia as a transit country to enter. European Union to enter European states and uh, uh, Finland was one of the directions. I don't know why, but uh, many of them did, did wanted to enter Finland through Russia and uh, Helsinki did not find any better solution than to shut down initially four border crossings, then additional ones and then additional and eventually all border crossings were shut down with Russia. And, uh, well, these refugees now probably will try to uh, cross. If they will go northwards, uh, if we take a look on the map, dear friends, refugees can move uh, northwards and try to cross the uh, border with Norway. So this is a borderline between Russia and Finland. And Russia is also bordering Norway. And if uh, refugees... Uh, from these uh, third countries will try to move northwards and uh, they may have a chance to, to enter Norway. I don't know, because there was a report that Norway is also planning to shut down its border crossing with Russia exactly because of because they, they fear that uh, that's exactly what refugees will do. They will move northwards and will enter Norway. Or, or uh, these citizens of... Uh, uh, I don't know from which countries, but from some third countries may enter, may try to enter some Baltic states. They may move uh, southwards on the southern side towards Baltic and enter Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia or Lithuania. They can try that. Or they may ask, uh, they may seek uh, asylum in Russia. Although, of course, Russia don't have uh, as uh, as favorable for them uh, system as European states, because uh, as you can see in Europe, you can do nothing and earn uh, earn some money. Uh, in Ireland, like two hundred and something euros weekly. That's for one person. So, if if you are, let's say, I don't know. Four four person family, I guess you will have about thousand euros a week. And then, uh, if you have been provided by housing also, then uh, well, I don't see in incentive in this case for these refugees to to even seek for a job if they are receiving like four thousand euros a month or even more by doing nothing then. Well, uh, of course, uh, they're going to be happy and they may even find some side work uh, and uh, do, didn't report about it so they can have even more money. So this system in the Europe uh, clearly have been abused, clearly have been abused. And uh, many, many states, many citizens in Europe do understand uh, just recently a member of our community from Finland did uh, uh, write me exactly that in comment sections that people are entering Finland and they're just abusing system, social system there. Uh, and they are not even trying to work and participate, you know, in building economy and be, you know, useful for society and so on. So that's also an issue, isn't it? And Russia don't have such a system. Man. Here, no one gonna, you know, you may receive refugee status, but you know, I had I, I know this perfectly well because uh, when we were forced to flee Georgia during uh, President Yosakashvili in Georgia, we 
uh, we end up in Russia and we had refugee status and uh, for for a number of years dear friends and uh, me and my family we did not receive single ruble single ruble from Russian government we never ask but we never given we were never given uh, so that's that's how it is here in Russia Ukrainian refugees do have support that's a whole different story because uh, Ukrainians are seen in Russia very differently it's a, it's a brotherly nation and uh, and uh, thousands and thousands of families by the way both sides millions of families have relatives on both sides so Ukraine is a very different story but uh, when it comes to some third countries uh, they may ask uh, asylum in Russia uh, of course and they may receive but if they think Russia will you know do the same as Ireland does for example no Russia will not do the same and that's why probably they are not asking asylum in Russia because they know uh, that they have to you know they have, have to pay for themselves uh, and uh, well, that's why they are trying to enter Europe because it's uh, easier. And and dear friends, we should uh, always keep in mind that uh, significant number of people among this wave of refugees are true ref refugees, true refugees that are seeking safety. First of all, uh, and only some part in these waves are uh, e economical migrants. That's how, how you say it. That just want to, you know, uh, improve their standard of living. And they also have a right to do so. You know, but uh, I don't see them as a refugees. I mean, because refugees are people who are uh, seeking security, who, are, who have been forced to flee their own countries. That's a refugee. But if you are, if you're f trying to enter other country because you want to improve your living conditions and you have every right to do so of course then i don't see you as a refugee you are just a ordinary migrant that's that's migrant isn't isn't it people always mig migrate on this world and it will always be this way i mean you may live uh, today in this country and after tw 20 years uh, move to another country it's 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 okay but anyway, anyway, let's uh, let's continue. I, I just wanted to highlight that they are this issue in Europe, and uh, our friends from Europe probably will you know, comment on this uh, topic that uh, some people are abusing in Europe this system that they have in place to support real refugees. Let's continue now, and uh, well, you may find it uh, interesting, dear friends. Uh, RT is reporting that uh, migration costs one of the EU states uh, 400 billion, uh, cost 400 billion. The Dutch government spending on migrants exceeds the average outlay on education, social security, and the benefits, according to new study. The net cost of uh, immigration has uh, reportedly amounted to more than uh, 400 billion euros, which is 430 billion dollars at the current rate over the nearly 25 year time frame. So in last 25 years, Dutch government spend uh, spend uh, uh, about 400 billions euros on on uh, on on refugees and on 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 migrants basically which is quite a number isn't it i was surprised because i mean wow how many refugees are in netherlands i mean millions because 400 billion is a huge number even for 25 years i don't know man but you know the study uh, titled uh, borderless uh, welfare state the consequences of immigration on public uh, finances uh, found that uh, cost cost uh, 
incurred by immigration policies in the Netherlands have totaled 17 billion a year on average, with a peak of 32 billion on to, in 2016 due to uh, 2015 refugee crisis. So, well, that's numbers for you. Uh, that Dutch government spends about 17 billion euros average on uh, on on refugees on on migrants and 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 so on quite a number quite a number and uh, in 25 years this number amounted to 400 billion well i have no statistics how many uh, refugees are in in um, netherlands but probably huge number i don't know Anyway, RT is reporting, RT is reporting that, uh, and dear friends, these numbers and this type of statistics probably are one of the reasons why Finnish government is acting the way that they are acting. They just don't want to spend billions and billions, you know, on refugee crisis. And that why, that, that's why they are basically sealing them, uh, sealing the borders, and they are, uh, uh, you know, trying to make as, as hard as possible for, uh, for refugees and migrants to enter Finland. But anyway, let's uh, continue. EU state claims that fellow member is against uh, Europe. Quite interesting, quite interesting. Hungary's stance on Ukraine suggests that it is uh, opposed to European values. Lithuanian foreign minister Gabrielos Landsbergis claimed on Monday while addressing an EU foreign minister's event. Well, I don't know who give, uh, who give uh, this uh, animal microphone, this Nazi animal, this uh, Landsbergis, and why these stupid individuals even are uh, allowed to speak uh, in, the, in the conferences. They should uh, check, they should ch have some uh, IQ tests. They should have IQ tests before anybody will speak in Europe on some conferences because, I mean, it's just too much at this point. It's really too much to hear these crazy statements from idiots. I mean, total uneducated idiots in, uh, in, uh, in uh, European elites. And this animal is no exception, 100%. I mean, who the hell is he to criticize Hungary, man? Hungary is like 100 times more important state than uh, uh, Lithuania will ever be ever and the uh, hungarian government has a million times more respect uh, worldwide than uh, lithuanian elites will ever have so who the hell is this animal to criticize hungary man and why is this kind of uh, crap individuals are allowed to spoke on these conferences and and in further destroy basically reputation of uh, european union because world is watching World is watching, world is listening, and someone I don't know, man, in India or in China or in Brazil, man, will see this information and probably think to themselves, I mean, who these crazies are really? And who give a right, any right to this idiot from Lithuania to teach a leadership of Hungary how they should act and how uh, they should uh, protect interests, best interests of Hungary? What, what's going on in Europe at all? I mean, this is crazy, man. This is just too crazy, really. And uh, I, I'm quite sure some IQ tests have to be, I mean, done before somebody is appointed as a, as a high-ranking official, man. Because too many idiots in Western leadership. Too many idiots, man. Uh, really, how else are uh, you going to comment this, man? Who cares? I mean, I don't think uh, Hungary even responds to this, but uh, I mean, I don't know, maybe foreign minister of Hungary, who, who is a quite legendary person, Siarto, maybe he will say a few kind words towards this uh, idiot man, Landsbergis. Maybe in private, he can teach him some lessons, man, that he can, you know, better if he will uh, look at uh, his own country, on Lithuania, which is in... in uh, failed another failed state 
that totally depends on uh, on uh, EU, totally. And Lithuanians, young generation of Lithuanians, are running away from this this crappy country, so-called country, because they have no future there. They just have no future. And why? Because of these idiots, man, in government. There's these Nazi animals in government. Anyway, let's continue. Uh, RT is reporting that another EU state, uh, states truckers block Ukrainian uh, uh, freight. Uh, well, I did report that Hungarian truckers were planning, Hungarian truckers were planning to begin their protests uh, on the border with Ukraine, and they did. And they did, and uh, well, now the okay, regime gonna experience some difficulties uh, on the borderline with Hungary. Also, and yesterday, your friends, there was some reports that Kiev did manage to achieve some uh, agreement with Warsaw, with Polish government, to unblock uh, border crossings and free border crossings from Polish truckers and farmers. Um, and uh, well. <clears throat> I was surprised to hear that, that some agreements have been reached by Kiev and Warsaw. And after several hours, after several hours, I did see news that uh, Polish truckers uh, are continuing to uh, conduct their protests on the border crossings. So nothing fundamentally has changed. They may stop uh, their protest for uh, several hours while, while, while they were negotiating maybe with the representatives of uh, Warsaw and they may not achieve nothing and as a, as a result of it uh, uh, Polish truckers and farmers are continuing their protest on the border with uh, Ukraine and also in Slovakia protests are taking place all, all these countries are fed up man with, with uh, this so-called state under the name of Ukraine they are too tired of Ukraine man TAS News Agency is reporting that uh, in US, uh, US congressmen uh, did approve bill to ban uh, imports of uh, Russian uranium into into US. And uh, uh, Russian law enriched uranium. Uh, although, although, same, same time, uh, first of all, this bill will uh, begin working in 90 days. So during the 90 days, I guess, uh, U.S. energy companies that are operating with uh, in, uh, nuclear power stations will, will try to buy as much uranium as possible from Russia. And, uh, and secondly, secondly uh, U.S. lawmakers did leave some, uh, some door, open door, uh, articulating that if State Department will uh, give a permission, will allow, then uh, then U.S. companies may be able to buy some uranium from Russia also. So this is purely political step, political step, because lately there was uh, quite a noise on this topic that uh, while Washington is calling other countries to impose sanctions on Russia, Washington itself is uh, quite actively buying some goods from Russia including uranium and this is a kind of attempt from Washington to yet again do some damage control and and save the face but yet again as I said they are leaving door open uh, next 90 days they can buy as much uh, uranium from Russia as they want and after that still door will be open because uh, if the State Department will approve then uh, US companies will be able to buy uranium from russia and uh, of course state department will approve what else they can do because uh, i don't know how many it's, it's according to some reports 30 percent of uh, u.s uh, energy generated by uh, u.s nuclear power stations are due to russian uranium so but anyway anyway uh, let's continue RT is reporting that Russian aluminium producers warn of a crisis. This is quite uh, interesting news. So Russia's Aluminium Associ Association has issued a green warning for the industry as it faces Western sanctions, tariffs and the drop in the prices for uh, one of the world's most uh, widely used metals. 
In its uh, latest overview of the current state of the industry, the association has warned that the entire sector is uh, on the verge of a uh, serious crisis, adding that uh, several enterprises of Russian aluminium giant Rusal are at risk of a closure. Um, well, a number of Rusal enterprises are already operating on the verge of zero or even negative profitability, as association uh, said on a Monday, adding that uh, further deterioration on the economic situation or increase in the fiscal burden may lead to the need to shut them down. It, won it warned that the crisis could affect 5,000 jobs in the sector, while up to 30,000 jobs in related sectors may also be lost uh, well quite interesting news quite interesting news and most important most important topic here is this episode uh fiscal burden fiscal burden you know uh further deterioration on economic economic situation or increase in the fiscal burden may lead to this and that so when i read this i did realize that these guys just want uh lower taxes they just want lower taxes and maybe maybe some some support from government uh, below be, below taxes they want low taxes and also maybe some billions from government as a, as a support because russian government does time to time when some crises is, are erupting russian government is trying to support uh sectors of the economy uh but uh, and maybe this is the case maybe it's true maybe aluminium sector is experiencing some huge difficulties uh, although i don't believe in this not even for a second this is our this is our businessmen man they all, all they care is more profits and they want low taxes or at least taxes not to be increased and uh, and probably they want some additional billions from uh from Russian government that's all it is man that's how I read anyway this information and I will definitely pay attention on this topic let's see if, if there will be any reaction from Russian government I guess uh, someone from Ministry of Finances will will make some strong statements towards this uh, businessman's uh, let's see let's see maybe there is some crisis but I just don't see it I don't see it because demand on aluminium is uh, huge worldwide prices are no less than two years ago two three years ago uh, russia is selling plenty of this metal all around the world <clears throat> so i don't see a reason why uh, producers of uh, rabbi rusal or other companies in this seg segment should be uh, you know on the verge of collapse no they just want some tax breaks and uh and some money from government that's all it is man business is business everywhere man i these giants are i guess same way are operating in europe and they're operating in same way in us in china just about everywhere they just want more tax breaks and the more uh more government support so that they can profit more but why should government support these private uh, businesses man 5000 jobs will be lost okay russian economy needs manpower these people will find jobs in some other sectors but if the companies are unable to be profitable let them shut down that's uh, that's open market that's uh, how it's supposed to be if business is not profitable shut it down man that's it no taxpayers money should be spent on those idiots man that cannot run business properly that's my take on it anyway am i right why should i pay for uh, uh, mistakes that are making these uh, giant businesses why should i pay for it from my taxes or or any other citizen of russia and if there will be some cuts in in the workplaces okay there are plenty of jobs in russia and everybody can find a job if you want to everybody RT is reporting that uh, Russian Arctic investments are booming, which is a huge deal, really. That's that's nice news here. 
the launch of a special economic zone with a wide range of tax breaks and other business incentives in the Russian Arctic has helped to attract significant investments. First Deputy Minister of uh, Development of the Far East and Arctic, Gaji Magomedov, uh, Gaji Magomed Gusenov has uh, said, according to the official who was uh, addressing the conference uh, delegated to development of the region last week, uh, over 760 projects with a total investment of uh, 1.75 trillion rubles, which is 18.4 billion US dollars, could be realized due to uh, mechanisms of state support approved in 2020. This would help to create around 40,000 jobs with more than 30,000 positions having been already set up, he said. So, yes, Russia is investing heavy in Arctic, in, in its northern regions, especially because of huge perspectives for a North Sea route. And I do regularly talk about uh, this North Sea route, which, is, which goes all along the, this northern coastline of Russia, and uh, and I believe in 10-15 years time, 20 years time, this uh, sea route will be major one in the world. Major one in, in the world and, and uh, tens of millions of tons of goods will be moved uh, through this uh, northern sea route on uh, every, every year. And uh, Where is the news? And uh, well, because of this uh, immense investment in the North Sea route itself uh, to, to establish infrastructure for support of the, for the ships and to, to establish port, portal area uh, infrastructure and so on. Of course, uh, regions in, this, in, the, in those areas are also receiving uh, huge investments, huge investments and are attracting people also. And uh, well, According to this report, uh, some 40,000 jobs will be created as a result of investments that already be been approved for this moment, which may not sound huge, but uh, well, we are, when we are talking about northern, uh, most northern regions of Russia, I mean, uh, weather conditions there are such that I don't think we will ever see millions of people are you know happily moving towards those directions even though wages here, here in russia by the way most high wages in russia are exactly in that northern regions it, it's i mean twice three times higher than average i, I guess uh, average wages in russia if not more exactly because this uh, extreme weather conditions in these northern regions but little by little little by little i mean uh, infrastructure is build, build investments are going in into those directions and uh, i'm quite sure there will be people who who will you know who will uh, find it uh, feasible for them to live in, in in the northern regions and and work there most northern regions and uh, and be happy be happy and what if if uh, i don't know it's all around the winter you know for some people, it may be okay. Uh, RT is reporting. RT is reporting that uh, well, countries are stockpiling gold, uh, and uh, well, central bank have uh, continued. The central banks worldwide are continuing the gold buying spree, with reports uh, re uh, with the uh, reported net monthly purchase totaling forty two tons. In October, the World Gold, Gold Council has uh, revealed, and the major buyer, major buyer is uh, China, on the market at this uh, at this point. Although some other countries are also buying plenty of uh, golds, and well, when it comes to gold reserves in gold and foreign currency reserves uh, worldwide, China is number one, I believe, uh, but Russia is uh, also among top five. Russia is also among top five. Russia also has a quite a volume of gold in its uh, storage. 
the uh, when it comes to china the people's bank of china remained the largest uh, uh, buyer largest buyer on the market uh, and uh, in uh, in october for example they buy 23 tons of the gold and overall overall china at this point uh, has uh, 2.2215 2, tons of gold 2.215 2, tons of gold 2200 kilograms so no 2000 oh, i'm i'm too tired now man so you can read it isn't it with its overall reserves amounting to 2000 uh, and 215 tons of uh, gold yes that's it man okay i have to end this video because uh, i'm getting too tired uh, but russia is somewhere there for sure russia is definitely no it's us man it's us number one if i'm not mistaken it's us number one isn't it uh, china may be largest buyer China may be largest buyer, uh, but uh, U.S. is number one when it comes to total reserves uh, of the gold. China may be second. Uh, Switzerland is uh, also among top five for sure. Uh, and uh, Japan must be there, and Russia is also definitely among top top countries when it comes to gold and and foreign currency reserves but anyway but uh, but anyway i have to end this video it's almost two hours man unbelievable wow it's almost two hours longest video longest news update that i ever uploaded and i mean it's you can clearly see that it's long because uh towards the end i definitely uh, began losing concentration on the news but anyway anyway what can i do dear friends um, hopefully you will at least watch some parts of this uh, update uh, and uh, and if so if, if you find this video uh, interesting uh, please uh, consider to please consider to click that like button uh, leave some commentary about any topic you like and um, leave you know share with videos uh, with your friends uh, share links to videos or, or my channel with your friends uh, it probably will help to reach wider audience and uh, if you think this channel this project with several channels and programs are interesting useful and deserves to exist in this field of uh, news and political commentary please consider to support my work with small donations through paypal buy me coffee or by subscribing to my patreon page you can see links under this video in the description box or in the pinned um, comment uh, well too long video i i do it see it i understand but uh, what can i do man there's plenty of news plenty of interesting news and i just i'm trying to make as informative updates as i possibly can and uh, that's the result sometimes videos are just too long but anyway, have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you very much for your attention and support and take care. See you soon.